Hi, and welcome to the Tomato Timer, a podcast about learning to learn. I'm Zubair from Xenos, and I'm tuning in live with experts from around the world, asking your questions and hearing their stories, all before the timer goes off. 24 minutes and 39 seconds to go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 17 of the Tomato Timer. And today we have joining us Elaine Coffrey, and she's an operations manager at Syngenta, which is uh, uh, kind of a agricultural herbicide kind of company. Um, but we'd love to hear a lot more from you. Hi, Elaine, can you hear us? Hi, is that better? Hi, yes, perfect. Thank you for joining us from all the way from north of Scotland, is that correct? Yes, I'm right in the middle of Scotland and, and well, in manufacturing site, I work on in Grangemouth, right in the centre of Scotland. That sounds beautiful. How is it there? Um, the sun's just came out. It was cold this morning, but it's got much better. That sounds amazing. So, Elaine, we want to dive right in and find out about like a long, but I'm sure a career with lots of stories to tell. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. So what is it that you're doing right now? So right now I am an operations manager is my official title. Um, mm-hmm. So what that means is there is a, there's a number of manufacturing facilities on our site and I am in charge of one of them. So that means everything from the safety aspects, the human resources, managing teams, it's interactions with business and supply chain. It's looking at financial. Yeah. It's basically every aspect of manufacture is my responsibility in that particular unit. And as well as that, I get responsibility for site logistics. So sort of moving of materials and waste in and out the site as well, which is mm. something that I've only done for the last sort of two or three years and has been really interesting, really different. Yeah. Could you just give a little bit more context about what your company is doing exactly in terms of the agricultural industry? Yeah, so it's Syngenta. I mean, it's it's on the web. You can go and have a much more detailed look than I'll be able to describe to you. But mm. we basically manufacture crop protection products and we've now got a seeds division as well. Um, so the, the, the strap line is bringing plant potential to life. We really, the what Syngenta want to do is to make sure that the world has enough food. We all probably know better than I will what the um, forward view is of the number of people and the amount of food that's going to be available in Syngenta's yeah. definitely involved in that. Our, our whole philosophy is about making sure that people have enough to eat. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, we have a, a growing population, a global population, so I'm sure that will be a crucial thing to start thinking about. So I want to go back a bit. I want to understand what were those kind of all the roles that you've been through and some of the interesting aspects of those, because in 25 years, I'm sure you've done lots of different things as well. Yep. So when I was at school, I, I didn't really enjoy school that much. I didn't enjoy studying. Um, I was much more practical, Mm -hmm. um, needed to be able to relate to something. And I was concerned if I'd went to university, I wouldn't have been able to stick the more studying and because I couldn't, I couldn't apply that to a job or an occupation that I really wanted to do. Yeah. The key thing I did do was I really liked science and chemistry all the way through school. It was basically science, maths, um, and in particular chemistry at that point. Now, this is back in the dark days when you didn't get engineering science and mm-hmm. computer aided yeah. design and all the nice things that the schools get now. Um, so I stuck to chemistry. Okay. Um, I applied to universities. I had unconditional, so I, I had places in university for chemistry, for marketing, for physiology and sports science, because I did a lot of sport when I was younger. Oh, wow. Um, but I really didn't want to do that. So I, I chose to go the apprenticeship route. So... I started work, it was ICI at the time. So again, you can Google ICI, but ICI was a much more diverse company. So it still did plant protection, but did a lot of colours and dyes and pharmaceuticals even. Okay. So the the apprenticeship that I got was absolutely amazing. It was a four-year apprenticeship. There was six-month placements in different areas. So I mm-hmm. I did eight different placements, obviously, through the four years. Yeah. I did pharmaceuticals. I did analytical and lab placements. I did agrochemical placements, so plant protection out in manufacturing. Yeah. And while I did that, I did part-time study. So all the way through four years, I did day release. And I found this I actually got better marks studying there than I did anywhere else <laughs> because I could apply it to what I was doing at work. Mm. And that worked for me not for everybody but definitely worked for me 
worked for me so much that when I came out of my apprenticeship, I then went and studied online and I now do have a chemistry degree, um, which has uh, shocked my mum probably more than anybody else <laughs> because I, I really didn't like studying, but it, it really helped me to be able to apply it to the roles that I was doing in my work. Um, so it's one of the reasons I am a STEM ambassador and I do this kind of thing is to try and, and tell particularly younger school students that there isn't, there's more options than just university. Absolutely. And how is that? So I'm assuming that after the apprenticeship, then you had to go back in and study an online degree. How did that feel? And did it feel like you'd already done a lot of stuff because you had, you'd had so much practical experience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so straight after, so I did four years and then just continued my um, okay. service with, it was still ICI at that point. So continued then and did day release to university. Mm. So we did a really long day from nine o'clock till kind of seven, half seven at night um, with the classes during the day with the normal sort of full time students. And then our labs were at night. I found it incredibly easy to do it because we were because I still worked in the lab environment at that point. I had lots of people with lots of qualifications, a lot more than I did, who I could go and ask questions to. Um, and actually, within the practical labs, we were helping the university as much as they were helping us. They, for example, they had an instrument that they hadn't used for five years that we got working for them and were able to wow. give them that expertise because we had one that was working. Yeah. So a totally different university experience, I suppose, than most people have. It was a much more um, adult experience, if you like, where we were more like colleagues than teachers and students in a lot of ways. Mm, mm, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess one of the questions we had from our audience was about the general applications of chemistry in the industry. And I, yep. and I, I wanted to know, because uh, you obviously seen it from a, a, a completely unique perspective, you were actually applying it even before you actually got to university. So how was that? What did you see were the main principles that were in action in industry? So I think the, the thing people see chemistry as a very, um, I think singular experience, but well, theoretical. But everybody mm. assumes it's organic chemistry and it's it's doing experiments and it's making chemicals. And there is that aspect of it, but there is also the analytical side of it, where you're checking for quality and um, the safety aspects of it as it's going through. And there's also physical chemistry, so particle size, viscosity, that kind of thing. And Actually, if I'm, I'm being honest, the physical chemistry was where I ended up after my placement um, because that was the bit that interested me the most and I was really, really lucky to end up in that department um, mm. after I did it. So it's it, chemistry. people say chemistry like it's one thing and it's really not. There's lots and lots of different aspects within it. Yeah. And even now in the sort of modern age, it's it's grown and grown and a lot of the technology has now been applied to chemistry so it's not just organic chemistry in the lab they do a lot of sort of modeling for us now where we'll give them a particular problem and when when i was was doing that we would have taken days or weeks to do lots of different experiments now we've got software that can mm -hmm. sort of model and trial it we can do probably 10 percent of the normal experiments give it the information and then it'll it'll direct the the experiments that you then want to do much more successfully it's really interesting mm -hmm. that is very interesting um and building on that actually you had that kind of lab-based experience while you were at university how did that feel like when you shifted back into kind of the large-scale industry and what were some differences you saw so it's i was still on the same site one of the placements i did uh, i think i had said was a, a lab within the manufacturing environment yeah so one of the things that we do is we train the operators to do some of their own qualitative analysis. So this is very quick, easy, easy analysis that they can do to check the quality as they're, they're manufacturing so that they can test if it's going off, if it's going off the rails, if it's going off spec and to make sure that it's still following the, the right guidance, the right guidelines that we want it to do. So Part of one of my placements was to do that. And then after I finished and I came out of physical science, my 
sort of first real project job was to do that was I, I was involved in setting up the labs doing the training for the technicians ordering equipment managing a small budget but managing a bit of a budget at that point as well mm -hmm. and it was at that point that I got more involved in the manufacturing aspects and realized that actually that was the career I really wanted and that was one of the reasons I felt incredibly lucky because I, I picked one career yeah. path if you like and it, it gave me exposure to lots of different um options and different opportunities i mean i could have done process engineering out of my apprenticeship as well rather than just chemistry i could have went and done a chemical engineering degree instead of chemistry yeah um that wasn't one of the options i wanted to do at the time but definitely once i got into manufacturing it was almost like jigsaw puzzle puzzle fitting together yeah and realized that actually that was much more suited to my personality and my skill base and mm. um, so at that point I made myself quite annoying if I'm being honest yeah. <laughs> and the, the operations manager who's got my job the job that I've got right now I just kept saying to him I really want to come and work for you I really want to come and work in this environment do you not have can can I not can you not find something for me to do to get me out um, and it probably took about 18 months oh wow from me opening that discussion to actually get the I was off <laughs> Unfortunately, I was offered a job, but because it was seconded, my my manager wouldn't release me at that point. Um, but I definitely ended up getting the job that I wanted, and I was happy to wait because it allowed me to continue to develop, to develop different skills, even though I wasn't in the job. But it gave me a target, if you like, of where I wanted to go. So, yeah, it was really, really interesting time, and and the the crossover yeah. was not easy. Um. But really, the best move I've ever made, and I'll continue to see some of the best careers and jobs that I've ever had where the sort of production managers, the first level production managers where I really was um, embedded into the manufacture and the management of the teams. It was really good. Mm -hmm. And I think you've captured perfectly a question we had was, which was like, how did you get into the large scale industrial manufacturing kind of area? And I'm sure it, it sounds like it was just like persistence and a real passion for that. <laughs> it was. I mean, there is obviously there's jobs that advertise. So, I mean, even even now we, we get regular emails and regular communication saying there's jobs. Glo I mean, Syngenta is a global mm -hmm. company. I could go to different places around the world. I don't need, I've chosen to stay in Grangemouth. That wasn't because I needed to do that. Um, I've chosen to stay in manufacture again. I could move out into the supply chain, into the business side. Um, we've had people who have gone into procurement from a similar background to me. I've had somebody who, who did go and do chemical engineering and, and is now a process engineer on site. Mm. You know, so the, the lots and lots of different options but the benefit of being in a, a sort of reasonable sized company, I mean, ICI was a much, much bigger company, but staying um, in Syngenta and the agrochemicals, it's still a big enough company that there is opportunity should you want them. Yeah. And you've mentioned chemical engineering a couple of times in the last couple of minutes. Um, could you just give us a little bit more kind of insights on that? Because um, what are the differences or the key differences between a pure chemistry degree and one that is chemical engineering? And and do you have any kind of like tips, especially for people who are thinking of pursuing that? Yeah, so I would say pure chemistry is, they're both technical, but in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, chemical engineering, there's definitely more requirement for maths and that kind of side of it, and obviously an engineering yeah. point of view. So the... <laughs> there's a bit of a, there's a bit of joke goes on in our place between the chemists and the chemical engineers because they do a lot of assumptions based on water and a perfect gas. And as, as we all know, it very rarely happens like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. So there, there is, there's crossover between both because you need a background in chemistry. You need a, 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 a basic understanding of chemistry, but engineer, process engineering is much more practical applications, I would have said. Most of them are involved in our operations, our manufacturing and designing plant and telling me, you know, about heat transfer, um, about what size of condenser I need, what size of um, sort of, sort of what, um, what amount of steam I need, what temperatures I need to be able to get to. Whereas chemistry is all about what's inside that vessel. It's all about what's actually happening, how what reagents I need to add, what rates I need to add them at, yeah. what order I need to add them in, you know, and then what temperature it needs to go at. So there is there's definitely crossover between both areas. Mm -hmm. And the good thing is that I, I believe that 
even if you start off in one, it's relatively easy to cross over between both. Okay. Um, process engineering is clearly um, part of my family because I have a cousin and my niece. My cousin now works for Shell and my niece has just finished her first year at Edinburgh, came to, to work with me and showed her the different roles and, and really liked the process engineering. However, she was interested as well. And we've got mechanical engineers, civil engineers, electrical engineers all on site and I think you, you tend to either lean one way or the other if that's your kind of background. I see that's very interesting especially the kind of wealth of kind of different backgrounds and experiences that are are part of an, an operation side I guess because you you I, I didn't obviously I didn't imagine this at all I, I thought it was just like chemists or just chemical engineers and very laser sharp focused on that it sounds no. yeah it's a massive big team all with different skills base all with different um, levels of expertise and we I need them all I basically stand on top of them needing all of the information from all of the different functions yeah. to be able to make the right decisions yeah and one of the things that I'm sure that you've had to do is, is lead so many people so what are those some of the skills that you've over your over your experiences have developed and or have found crucial to your to your role and just uh, growing into your kind of uh, as as a person as well yeah, so I think leadership definitely is one of the areas that when I was younger I wouldn't have necessarily said would have been a, a strength of mine but actually as I've gone through my working life and both both in terms of attending courses so I've now done open university so I've done a certificate and a diploma in management Mm. Um, so for somebody who didn't want to study I've actually studied quite a lot <laughs> a little bit more yeah um, and then two years ago through Scottish Enterprise I did a leadership master class which was probably one of the best things I've ever done in my career um, where it brought lots of different um, people from a diverse range of backgrounds but, but it just proved to you that when you manage people it doesn't matter what industry you're in it doesn't when we had people from um, pharmaceutical labs we had one of the guys makes nail polish wow it's one of the biggest nail polish suppliers in the world but we all had very similar experiences in terms of managing people mm -hmm. so that was that was really really interesting um again i was one of the more mature people on that course and was able to give some insight into the experiences that i had i would say it's it's you can be a natural leader of course there's lots of people natural inspiring natural leaders but I think pretty much anybody can learn how to lead, but you need to know yourself. And that's where I think some people aren't willing to um, turn the mirror on themselves, where I have found a massive benefit out of doing that. I've had a lot of um, different applications used. So from Myers-Briggs to the latest one that I did with the Leadership Masterclass was Insights. And it tells you about the way that you manage, the things that you're good at, the things that are your, what you would call your blind spots, your development areas. Yeah. And I think if you're willing to do that, if you're willing to look at yourself like that and recognise the good bits, so everybody's got, got positives and got things that they're naturally good at, but actually be able to say that's one of the areas I am, <clears throat> excuse me, less good at and take the time and put a bit of effort into trying to understand that and, and either mitigate against it or improve it um key thing is you can't change people it's your personality but you can temper it you can adapt mm. for different environments for interactions with different people um and that's definitely in the role that i have i deal with right from what we call the shop floor so right from the operators the people making the product right up to sort of global supply chain and i need to be able to adapt my style depending on who i'm interacting with Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's that's just amazing and uh, honestly I, I wasn't sure what I'll be because even when we got your bio it was quite uh, quite short and I'm sure it was difficult <laughs> for you to like summarize it so short yeah, but I, I can I can like but from our conversation I've basically heard and understood theoretical chemistry process management process engineering chemical engineering um, and now it sounds almost like a an MBA uh, to some extent a business management course and it's just truly amazing to see that you've been in your career and in many ways not going directly in the in a kind of old-fashioned a university leads to a job leads to you know just doing other jobs um, you've been able to grow and develop so many skills and and academically as well 
and I still am. I mean, I've I'll be thirty one years on site in August, and I still feel like I'm learning. I still feel like there's there's wow. there's more to go at. Yeah. And does I actually had a question? It's 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 my own question because um, my father actually also has been in the same job for over twenty five or eight years or so, and I always found it quite curious to see that some people just stick around and are are just so committed to a certain industry or a job role or, or not not exactly a job role but a, a certain organization, and I think the the nature of jobs has become quite. I'm not sure if this is the correct word, but disposable in the nowadays. It's like we think that one job is meant to kind of jump up and get to the next rung of the ladder. And I want to do just like a, on a much more general pretense, what is it like being in the same organization for so long? So I, again, I think it's a very individual preference. So we've, we had at one point three people on our site who had 50 years service. Wow. Who had came from sort of 15, 16 years straight from school and never left. And we still have one of them on site that I think is heading towards 52 years. Wow, that's amazing. Um, it is amazing. And again, when I started, my view was I'll do the apprenticeship, I'll do the four years, I'll get my qualifications, and then I'll decide. And I've been incredibly lucky to be offered different opportunities mm-hmm. to to because the company was big enough because the site's big enough to be able to go and do different experiences to move even though I've stayed in manufacturing for the majority of the career I've moved up levels I've done projects I've been involved I mean as I said recently I'm on site logistics which is a new new skill for me a new a whole new raft of experiences so I think that That is the answer. You don't need to jump company to company, but most people would struggle to see in exactly the same job. There's a few who don't like change. And we have a few definitely on site Mm -hmm. like that who have done, so that there's people who started at the same time as me, probably were the year ahead, who haven't really left the labs, who enjoy their work. That's what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's right for them. It just wasn't right for me. Um, I think that what possibly would have made me move is if I had to stay in the same job, if I hadn't had the opportunities. Yeah. The other thing about the company is I feel we we put safety first. We put safety definitely ahead of production. We look after the people on our site and within our company. That's a real big thing. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a big thing for the company and it's a big thing for me. And some of that is not obvious. It's hard for me to describe. It's hard for me to quantify. Yeah. Um, but I feel protected i feel looked after i feel supported i've i obviously know know the majority of people on site because i've (laughs) been there forever yeah um and i think that helps you build good relationships and when you've got good teams round about you teams that you know will perform teams you know will do what you want then why would you leave and risk going to another company or another job role where you you can't guarantee that you've got that Mm. Mm. And it also sounds almost like that there are certain values that the organization believes and practices that resonate with yourself as well. Safety. I mean, the, the, the role I'm in just now being in charge of individuals in a manufacturing environment, safety is a massive thing. The, the absolute worst thing that could happen to me was somebody got hurt. Um, and that's one of the reasons the values the company has, that they put safety very, very high in the agenda, makes a big difference. Mm. Did you, um, over this period, did you ever face a time when when there was gender discrimination or imbalance in, in the job that you were doing or in the in the industry itself? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I started, there was no female apprenticeships. Wow. No female. There was two, two females out of three in the lab technician, chemical technician, one that I did, but there was none in any of the manufacturing apprenticeships. Um, they were desperate in fact at at that point you got to choose top three apprenticeships and I had chosen manufacturing as well Um, and had I not put chemistry as my number one I may well have ended up being the first female apprentice Um, however yep in manufacturing I have been I've I I suppose trailblazing if you want to be as um, positive as that I was the first person in production first female in production first female operations manager um there is there's definitely more numbers now much more um 
we do we we publicise regularly where the gender diversity is across the site, across mm. the company. It's something that the company feels um very strongly about is to try and, and be as diverse as they can and get the benefits out of that. Yeah. Um, in the central belt in Scotland, it can be quite difficult. But, um, for example, our site leadership team has somebody from New Zealand, somebody from South Africa. There's probably just under half of us are female. Um, there's somebody from Ireland. I'm trying, you know, so there's there's there is lots of different dynamics coming into it now. But yes, being the first female in manufacturing was difficult, but it's back to a personality and a, a management style again i yeah. like that i like being different i like standing out it worked for me um i don't feel i was negatively biased against it in fact if anything it was positive mm. because anything that i did was much more visible so if i did something well it was much more obvious than if any one of the men that i worked with had done basically exactly the same thing yeah because they were watching me because I was the first female and they were all not not waiting for you to fail, but they were interested to see how how that worked, how I got on working with men, how men responded to having a female manager. Yeah. That is truly inspirational because we've and somehow it's it's been a coincidence, but the the everyone is kind of a lot of uh, I think most of the people who volunteered their time to come on our podcast have been females and we've just been so inspired by all of them to hear and and just how how much it takes to to get into these kind of careers and industries which are so um i guess polarized or in in or in in a certain kind of gender or something like that and it's inspirational to hear from you as well how you've literally picked up a role and and made it your own and and made an, a role model out of yourself to to all the new and upcoming females who are going to be thinking of a, a job like that as well thank you that's amazing. Well, I think that's a, a very perfect point. And, and because although we started a couple minutes late, we've been capturing uh, exactly a Pomodoro worth of time anyway. And it was just so amazing to have you. And we do have a lot more questions, but we need to stick to our times and all that. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining us and sharing your story. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. And thank you to all our live listeners as well. And hopefully we can see you next week on our next episode. Bye, guys. Bye bye. And that's another episode of the Tomato Timer. If you'd like to ask your questions and join us live next week, join the Xenos Discord server. The invite link is in the description. And to learn more about Xenos and how a bunch of students are on a mission of making quality education accessible to all, go to xenos.org. Bye for now.